Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video, I'm going to teach you how to play Nexus. This is a brand new game from Dverse Publishing. It is a two to four player game that takes roughly 60 to 90 minutes to play, and is a competitive game where players are going to be competing throughout the game to gain cred coins. So in the game itself, you are going to be playing one of the Lannistas, and you bring these different helots to the arena, these meat bags, basically to command them around to beat the heck out of other helots in the hopes of gaining fortune and glory. Now, this relationship means that you do not care about your helot at all. Whether they win or lose, gets killed, it does not matter to you as long as you get your fortune and glory. And getting the crowd into it is one of the key things, as you're going to be able to gain cred coins by beating the snot out of your opponent's helots and involving the crowd, getting them excited, using the arena to your advantage, moving around, and just causing all kinds of mayhem. That will get the crowd excited and applause for you, gaining you that important fortune and glory, and getting you those cred coins. At the end of the game, the player that has the most will be the winner of the game. So in this video, I'm going to teach you how to play, starting with components, setup, player turns, and end game conditions. As always, if you find my videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider hitting that like button and subscribe to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow be able to produce this content. If you want to stay up to date on all my videos, also consider giving that notification bell a ring, and that'll let you know whenever I drop new stuff. So I'm constantly dropping new teaching videos, playthroughs, Kickstarter coverage, game found coverage, and many other types of videos. Also, let me know in those comments down below if there's anything else you would like covered. I'm always open to hearing from you and starting a conversation. So let's head to the table, and I'll teach you how to play. The first component I'll go over are the dice, and there's going to be a whole collection of different dice that players are going to be using throughout the game. The first die is a trait die, and this is going to list the six different traits that each helot has. Next is the ratio die, and this is going to be numbered one to six on it. And at the beginning of the game, each player is going to receive one of each of these dice. During the initiative round, each player is going to roll their set of dice, which will determine which trait and their breakdown of movement action points that they have to spend. And I'll cover this more later in that section. Next are the combat dice, and there's going to be attack and defensive dice. Each one of these dice is going to be numbered 1 to 6. Then you have your trait counter dice on them. These are going to keep track of your different traits and how, much, how many points you have in each one of them. And these are going to be numbered 0 to 5. Then I have the eight-sided dice. You have the compass die, and this is going to determine random directions on the arena board, as well as the grid dice, which is going to determine random movement and placement of objects on the arena board. From there, there's going to be a number of different decks of cards that players are going to be interacting with throughout the game. During player setup, each player is going to be randomly dealt or will be able to choose a Lannista that is going to represent them in the game, as each player is one of these Lannistas floating above the arena battlefield yelling at their helots commands on things that they're hoping that their helot will do. Each of these cards is going to list the name on the top of the card of that Lannista, and on the back of the card again is going to list the name of the Lannista, as well as three different stats. The first one is Influence, and this is going to be the number of Influence cards that player will start the game with. Next is Deception, and this is again going to list the number of tokens that player will start with in their Deception, as well as Command, which again is going to list the number of Command tokens that player will start with. And I'll cover these more a little bit later in the video. The next deck of cards are the Helots, and there's going to be four different Helots included in the core game. Each one of these on the front is going to list the name of that Helot, and on the back is going to be a number of different features. Each helot will have bonus traits, which will you will increase during setup, which I will cover a little bit later. And then they're going to have unique trait abilities. And these are going to list two different unique traits. Each one is going to have its own name and the traits or trait points that you have to spend in order to activate it and then the effects of that activation. Finally, at the bottom of the card is an innate ability that that different helot has and how it works. The next deck of cards are the influence cards. During setup, this deck is going to be shuffled and dealt out to all players, and then each player is going to look at the cards that are dealt to that player, and will choose a number of them based on their Lannista's influence stats, which again I'll cover during setup. Each of these cards is going to list the name of the card, its effect, and how it works, and when the card can be used. For example, with knowing is half the battle, this one allows an opponent must reveal their influence cards, and this card may be used at any time. The weapon deck is going to contain all kinds of different weapons that the players may gain throughout the game. Each of these weapons on the back is going to list the name of the weapon on the top, along with all the different stats for that weapon, including a description of how to use it, 
if it has any ammo, any draw or store costs for that weapon, if it needs line of sight, its optimal range, and damage that the weapon does, along with other instructions or ways that you can use that weapon. And the final deck of cards are the turning point cards. Throughout the game, there are going to be certain circumstances which, when met, will have a player draw a turning point card and resolve its effects. On the back of each of these cards, it lists the name of that card and the effect of the card, whether it affects just that player that drew it, or all players, or other conditions that might be involved with that. And these can be really nasty cards, or will really shake up and change certain things in the game. For board setup, the first thing you're going to do is place the game board out in the middle of the table, and then you're going to choose a schematic you want to play. These are going to be found on page 38. You can either choose one of these, or you can roll a d8 to randomize the one that's selected, or you can come up and create your own. It's up to you. I'm going to be using the number one schematic. Once you've completed setup, then you're going to choose if you want to include any random hazards. In the core game, there are two different options. You'll have the floor saws, or the spike pits. For this example, I'm going to go ahead and use both of these, which you can do. So I'm gonna simply place those off to the side and those will be deployed at later points during the game as I'll explain in that step. Shuffle up and place the turning point cards somewhere on the game board and then go ahead and place the weapon deck out. This deck does not need to be shuffled. Place out all the different dice that you'll be using for the game, including the attack and defensive dice, your grid dice and your compass die. You can also place out the reference cards for the different hazards included in on the board, as well as any additional ones that you've chosen to use. Again, the floor spikes, the floor saws, and you also have the brazers and the crates that are already on the game board. Before moving on to player setup, I do want to cover the airy command panel and break this down. So each player is going to receive an airy command panel that's broken down into two sections that will be held together by magnets. The first one is going to track the helot's health, and this is going to be tracked in two different sections. Each helot is going to have an overall condition, which is the overall health of that helot, and then you're going to have the seven different body parts of that helot, with each one of them having a certain number of hit points. And this is going to include the head, the left upper and lower, the chest, the midsection, and the right upper and lower. At the end of the board, you're also going to have the initiative track for that player that they're going to be placing their ratio die in, and will determine what order that player will activate their helot in. Moving over to the other board, the top of the board is going to have a slit where players can place their condition tokens in to keep track of those throughout the game. Then you're going to have your trait counters that are going to be placed in here and keep track of each one of the different traits and how many points you have in that. Each one of those is going to have a name above it. Then each trait is also going to have a number of dots above it, which is going to be a quick reference to when that trait is going to be activated throughout the round or the initiative of that particular trait. Underneath that is going to be a slot for the different cred coins to be placed in. And when all of them are filled up, then you're going to trigger a turning point event. And I'll go over that a little bit more later. For player setup, first each player is going to choose a Lannister to represent them. Next, each player will be randomly dealt or again can choose a Helot that they want to control for this battle. Then with the Lannister, you can also gain a number of deception tokens and command tokens based on that Lannister. So with this one, I'm going to receive two command tokens and no deception tokens. Don't worry about the influence for now, I'll cover that next. From there then, each player is going to receive a command airy command panel and you're going to place a number of cred coins in that command panel based on the different locations. First, you're going to receive 10 coins for your head, then 12 coins for each of the upper and lower extremities, and 15 coins for your chest and midsection. Then place 50 coins in the overall condition section. You'll also receive the trait die and ratio die for your character. And then go ahead and place a trait counter die in each one of the sections and set it to zero. From there, then you're going to look at your helots card and your trait bonuses are going to list the starting traits you're going to receive a point in. So with this helot here, I'm going to receive one in willpower. So I'll increase that to one. I'm going to get one in daftness and one in swagger. You can also grab three tokens for your attack SDS and defense STS, as well as the five different condition tokens. You can also give each player a turn reference card and a quick reference guide for their different actions. 
From there, go ahead and shuffle up the influence card deck and deal the entire deck out to all players that are playing. In this game with two players, each player is going to receive 12 cards from this deck. And then from there, then each player is going to reference their Lannister card. And based on the influence, the number of influence points they have, they're going to gain a card from their deck of their choice for each one of those. For example, with my player over here, he has an influence of three. So he'll get to collect three cards from his deck. And then the rest of the cards can be returned to the game box as you won't need them for this game. You can also place out the extra blood and guts tokens as later points in the game might generate more of these tokens to be placed out. Then you're also going to want to designate an area to place the crowd coin pile somewhere. And so in this game, you're going to add five crowd coins per player. So I'm going to go ahead and start with 10 as I'm playing with two players. And I'm just going to place those down here. Finally, each player is going to place their helot on the game board. And they're going to place them in the leftmost square on their side of the board facing away from them. Next, this is played over an undefined number of command cycles. Each command cycle consists of two phases that are going to be done in order. The first phase is the initiative phase, and during this phase, each player is going to simultaneously be rolling their dice to determine their initiative order during the command phase. They're also going to handle a couple of their steps, which I'm going to cover a little bit later in the video. From there, then it'll move into the command phase, and during this phase, the player that has the highest initiative will get to take their turn first. That player is going to carry out a number of different actions, including moving around the board, attacking other players, interacting with their environment, using their skills and traits as they see fit, and using some of their other resources that they have. Once the player has completed their turn, then it'll move over to the next player that has the next highest initiative to take their turn. And this is going to continue going until all players have had a turn. Once that has happened, then the command cycle has come to an end, and the players will move into the next command cycle, and this is going to continue going until the end game condition is met, which is if one of the helots has been left standing, and all other helots have been incapacitated or have died, or in the rare case, if all of the helots have been incapacitated or are dead. In either situation, the game is over, and the players are going to determine the winner. First, the players are going to count up all of the cred coins in the crowd pile, then each player is going to total up all of the cred coins that they have in their pile, not including any coins from the area command panel of that player. From there, then they're going to determine the winner by determining if one player has more coins than any other player, including the crowd, then that player has won the game. If the crowd has more coins than any other player, then the crowd wins and the game is a draw, meaning that no player has won and the crowd basically has done better than the players have. So before moving on, there is one important concept that I want to talk about, which are cred coins. As this is the only way you're going to win the game by having the most of these at the end, how do you gain them? So first off, for the players, there's a number of different ways of doing this. You can gain them by beating the snot out of your opponent. Every time you deal damage, you're going to gain cred coins from your opponents overall, and potentially their limbs, depending upon how you attack them. You're also going to gain cred coins by activating your fame command, which is boasting how powerful you are, which is going to double the amount of coins you get for that round, but also leave you susceptible to counterattack. There's also a few other ways, such as triggering turning point influence or events, being able to use influence cards, and other things that will gain you cred coins. From there, how do you lose cred coins? So again, by being attacked. And also activating some of your advanced commands will cause you to pay cred coins to the crowd coin pile in order to activate those commands. And then also taking damage from the board itself, from hazards. Hazards will cause you to lose coins. And then finally, with the crowd itself, it is going to gain cred coins by having the hazards deal damage to other players. Players paying the coins to activate some of their abilities will go into the crowd. And the crowd is an active participant in this. So at the end of the game, if the crowd has the most coins, then the crowd is going to win and the players will all lose. So it is important to keep track of that as the crowd can build up fairly quickly depending upon what happens and what kind of hazards are out and how the players are playing. Moving into the game, the game itself is going to be played over an undefined number of command cycles. Each command cycle will be broken down into two phases, the initiative phase and command phase. Now I do want to point out in the rulebook it does list these as rounds, but I find it easier to explain as phases, so in this video that is what I'm going to use. So the first phase in each of the command cycles is going to be the initiative phase. During the initiative phase, all the players are going to simultaneously resolve this phase, and this phase is going to have a couple of steps. The first step is the players are going to gather up their ratio and trait dice and give them a roll. 
Once the players have rolled them, the players are going to determine their initiative order by comparing their results with all other players. You're going to reference the initiative order chart, as you can see on your quick reference guide and this image, as well as above your airy command panel, it is going to list that as well. For this result, these results, each one of these sections is going to have a name above it of that trait and a number of dots on that trait. That's going to determine the order. So as you can see on the initiative order, you have instinct first, followed by deafness, then cunning, and then the other three results after that. So the player that is highest on that track is going to be the highest or the player that is going to have the highest initiative. If two or more players are tied, so for example, since my player rolled initiative, and let's go ahead and say that the other player also rolled initiative and had this result on his ratio die. If two or more players roll the same result on that chart, the next thing they're going to do is reference their ratio die. If one player has a higher number on the ratio die, then that player will be higher on the initiative. So in this situation, player two would have a higher initiative or would go first between the two players. If both of these results are tied, then both players are going to roll a pair of D6s. And then the player that has the highest result on that will be the higher player or the player that will go first. If you tie for those, just continue rolling those dice until one player has a higher result. But let's go ahead and say instead that we had this result on the, on the rolls. The first player has the instinct initiative or trait rolled, so that player is going to be the first player to activate during the command cycle, followed by this player that rolled cunning. So from there, then, once the players have determined their results, they're going to take their ratio die without changing its results and place it in their initiative track based on whatever initiative they are. So with this player being the first player, he's going to place the ratio die in the number one slot. And then the second player will place their die in the number two slot on their initiative board. So you won't be pl placing all the dice on one board. The final step in this is to reference your trait die and the trait that you roll, you're going to increase that counter die by one. So this player rolling instinct, I'm going to increase my instinct die by one value. Once all the players have completed that step, then we're ready to move into the second phase in the round, which is the command phase. During this phase, each player is going to get to get a turn, starting with the player that has their die in the number one slot on their initiative board. After they have completed their turn, they'll move over to the next player in their, with their die in the number two slot, and so on until all players have had a turn. During a player's turn, there's a number of steps that are going to be done in order. The first step in this process is updating your turning point counter. In order to do that, you're going to reference your ratio die and the number you rolled on it, and check that number on your, your airy command panel. If that slot is open, you're going to take one coin from the crowd coin pile. And if the crowd coin pile is empty at this point, this is the one exception to the rule where you can take a coin from the box and place it in that slot. If there's already a coin in that spot, then you've triggered a turning point counter duplicate roll. In that situation, you're going to activate certain hazards that are out there, and you're going to reference those hazards, determine which ones. For example, at the beginning of the game, since I'm using spike pits and the floor saws, I would randomly place out one spike pit and floor saw and resolve the effects of that. If I had rolled another one and there was one, there was a coin in that spot already. Now from here, the next thing is to check to see if you have a turning point event, which means that you have filled up all six of these slots on here. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to take some time. So this is normally not going to happen until midpoint or later in the game and can be a big event. In order to carry this out, first, you're going to reference your hazards and resolve any of those that are out there that you'd need to resolve as some of those will have effects that will be triggered at this point. If there's already a turning point card out, also reference that as some turning point cards will have additional effects that'll be ha that'll happen when a new turning point card is going to come out. From there, you're going to draw the top card of the turning point deck and read the effects of it. Some of these are going to be positive. Some of them will be negative. For example, I have Tainted Love. So your helot chose the wrong pre-fight companion and now is now experiencing a painful burning. Your helot's midsection takes five damage. Your helot may spend three cunning in order to ignore these effects. So if I had three points of cunning, I could choose to spend those to negate these effects. Otherwise, I'm going to take five damage to my midsection that'll go to the crowd coin pile. And then this is going to simply be discarded as there's no other effects on that. Once you've resolved the turning point card, the next time your helot makes a successful standard or focused attack, you're going to do an additional six points of damage. This will not apply to grapple and wild attacks. 
The second step in a player's turn is allocating their command points. A player is always going to start this step with six command points that they can allocate towards movement and actions. In order to determine how to allocate them, you're going to reference your ratio die, and based on the number, it's going to determine how you break these points up. For example, with the starting player or the active player right now, that player rolled a 1, which means that they're going to have to spend 1 point in movement or actions, and then the 5 other points in movement or actions. So this player could choose to spend or have 1 movement point and 5 actions, or 1 action and 5 movements. And that it has to be declared during this step before moving on to the third step where you're going to actually spend these points. Now, during this step, another player can also choose to play a deception token if they have one. In that situation, if they play one, then that player gets to choose how those points are divided up. Again, using that ratio die. So that player can look at your position and say, hey, I want you to have five actions this turn and one movement, as you're most likely not going to be able to spend those all, and that way you're going to be taking damage, as you're going to see in the next step. Now, if that player plays a deception, you can choose to play two deception tokens to cancel that out. And that will end that step as no other player will be able to trigger that again during this command step. So for this example, I'm going to go ahead and state that I'm going to have five movement points and one action, as I will probably be able to spend most of those. And the other player has decided not to use a deception token, so we're ready to move on to the third step of the player's turn. The third step in a player's turn is spending their action and movement points to carry out different commands. And there's going to be a whole list of commands on the quick reference guide as you can see here. I'm going to take you through each one of these in more detail to show you how they work. And a player can carry these out in any manner they want to as long as they have the points to spend to do so. So the player can use a couple of move commands and then take an action command and do some more movements however that player wants to spend the points that they've allocated during step two. Another thing that a player can do during this is spending influence cards that will be triggered during this phase, or they can also trigger different traits as long as they have the points in that trait to carry it out. And I'm going to go into more detail about that a little bit later in the video. The first group of commands I want to talk about are movement commands. But before I do, there's one important term that I need to go over, which is FFD, or Front Facing Direction. In Nexus, the direction your Halot is facing is very important and is going to be part of the strategy that is going to dictate how you move around the board as well as how enemies are going to attack you. As when enemies get behind your helots, they're going to do additional damage. So being aware of your direction is going to be very important for your strategy. So moving into the first group of commands, there are three different movement commands in this group. The first one is moving forward. So maintaining your FFD, you can move one space forward or into either one of the 45 degree spaces in front of you. Again, maintaining your FFD. So I can spend one movement point to move forward or into one of these two spaces. One important note with this is that I'm not allowed to move into spaces that have certain obstacles, such as the crate, pillar, or brazier. Other obstacles, such as blood and guts, are going to have effects on movement when you move into spaces that contain them. And I'm going to cover this a little bit later in the video under obstacles. The rotate command costs you one movement point and allow you to rotate your helot 90 degrees either left or right, changing your front facing direction. Now there are a couple of important notes with this. First, you can only do this up to two times in a single space, which means you can only rotate up to 180 degrees. And when you rotate the first time, so let's go ahead and say I spend a movement point to rotate to the left. Now, if I wish to rotate again, I must maintain that rotation moving again left. I cannot choose to then go right as my second rotation. So it doesn't allow you to basically change back to your original position. The third movement command is going to cost you two movement points and allows you to either move back or to your left or right. Again, keeping your front facing direction. So looking at an example of this, I could spend two movement points to move back and then another two movement points to move to my left if I wanted to. Moving into advanced movement commands, these are not without risk. So with these movement commands, there are three different options again. The first one is stand up. With this one, when you have the prone status, you can take a stand up action. It's going to cost you one movement point and you're going to roll a d6. 
on a four, five, or six, you get to stand up and remove your prone status. Otherwise, if you fail the roll, rolling a one, two, or three, you simply maintain that prone status and no other effects happen. If you have additional moving points to spend, you can try this again. So let's go ahead and say that I have three moving points remaining and I have the prone status. I want to try to get up, so I'm going to roll. I rolled a four on my first one, so I get to remove this and then I can continue my turn as normal. One other important note with prone status effect is that if your helot is prone during an opponent's command round, the opposing helot receives an additional two action points that may only be used to attack your prone helot. The next advanced action is a backflip or sidestep. This movement action costs one movement point and allows you to attempt to move backwards or to your left or right, spending that one movement point and maintaining your front facing direction. With this, again, you're going to roll a d6. On a 4, 5, or 6, you are successful and get to move into that space of your choice. If you fail, instead you are going to fall prone and gain the prone status effect. And the final advanced movement command is Liberate. This one is the only option you can do if you start your command round grappled by your opponent. In order to do this one, it is going to cost you one movement point. You're going to have to spend one cred coin from your overall condition. You're gonna place that in the crowd coin pile and then you're gonna roll a d6. On a four, five, or six, you are liberated and will remove the grappled status effect from your area. And then you can take your turn as normal, spending any other additional points you have to continue doing that. If you fail by rolling a one, two, or three, then you are still grappled and you can try to take this action again if you have additional moving points to spend. Before moving into combat commands, there's a couple of important concepts I have to cover first. The first is the dice system in this game, which is called SDS, or Sliding Dice Scale. With this system, this works both with attacking and defending, and is very easy once you get the concepts behind it. So with this scale, you're always going to roll 2d6, and then if you have any modifiers to that, it's going to modify the number of dice you roll, and what the results are for those. So these modifiers are going to be attack plus and minus and defense plus and minus. For each plus or minus, you're going to add an additional die to your roll. If you are on the positive side, so if you have an SDS plus, then you're going to roll these dice and take the two highest results. If you are on SDS minus, you're going to again roll that number of dice and take the two lowest results on that. And this can stack all the way up to SDS plus three or minus three for attacks and defense. So the maximum you're ever going to roll is five dice. And then again, based on if you're in the positive, you'll take the two highest results from those dice. If you're in the negative, you'll take the two lowest results with those dice. Once you have those results, you're going to compare them with your opponents. If the defender rolled equal to or higher than the attacker's roll, then no damage is done. If the attacker rolls higher than the defender's roll, the difference between those two rolls is going to be the amount of damage that's done. And I'll cover this more during the combat command step. The other important thing I want to cover is positional bonuses. Depending upon where you are when you attack your opponent, you may receive bonuses for that. So the first one is a rear attack. If your helot is directly behind your opponent when attacking them, you are going to be SDS plus and will gain an SDS plus token you can place in your area. Now this is going to apply to regular attacks, focused attacks, and grapple, but not the grapple command group. And this will also not apply when taking an aim command, which I'll cover a little bit later in ranged attacks. Another positional bonus is against the wall. When you attack an opposing helot that is directly opposite another feature, they are going to get plus two damage on a successful standard or focused attack. Now this can be anything, including a brazier, a wall, another helot, a pillar, a, a, a crate, anything except for the guts and blood tokens. And again, this is going to apply to both the overall damage and the limb damage if there is limb damage when attacking, which again, I'll cover that during the next step. And the final positional bonus is a running strike. If you're able to move your helot two or more unoccupied spaces and then follow that up with a successful standard or focused attack on your opponent, then you have a chance at knocking your opponent prone. They're going to roll a d6 and on a one, two, or three, your opponent will take the prone status on top of any other damage that's dealt. And these also stack. So in this situation, if I moved up two, I would get a running strike on my opponent on top of the fact that my opponent is against the wall, so I would receive the bonus for that as well. 
Now, one important note with this is they have to be unoccupied spaces. So if one of those spaces contains blood, I would lose the bonus for running strike in that situation. So moving into combat attack actions, there are three main ones you're going to be using throughout the game. These are wild attack, standard attack, and focus attack. And I want to go through one main example and then talk about the other two as there's only going to be a couple of little changes with them. So the first one I want to talk about is a wild attack. With a wild attack, you can attack an opponent if it's in one of your front three facing spaces that are directly in front of you. So in this example, I'd have to move up one and then my opponent is in one of my front three facing spaces so I can attack them. From there, with a wild attack, it costs one action point. It's going to cost you one cred coin from your overall condition paid to the crowd coin pile, and you're going to be at SDS minus for that attack. From there, then you can go ahead and gather up your dice. So I'm going to receive three dice as I am SDS minus, and my opponent will receive two. And then I'm going to go ahead and give those a roll. So my opponent ends up getting a seven, and I'm going to roll mine, and I take the two lowest results. So I'm going to have a two and a five. For this example, let's go ahead and say that my opponent did pretty bad, though, and only rolled that result. So in this situation, I'm going to compare the dice and subtract the difference. So I have 7 to 3, so I'm going to do 4 damage to my opponent's overall condition. So I'll get 4 coins from that and add them over my area. And that'll conclude that attack. The next type of attack I can do is a standard attack. This one's going to cost me two action points, and I can only do this one if an opposing helot is directly in front of my helot's FFD. In that situation, then I'm going to take a standard attack, and this one, again, is going to have both players checking their modifiers to see if they have any modifiers to their SDS. In this situation, I do not, as this attack does not add any modifiers to either one of us. So we're both going to roll 2d6 for this attack and compare the results. So my opponent rolled an 11 and I rolled a five, so not enough. But let's go ahead and say instead that my opponent ended up rolling a four and I rolled a five. So I was successful in the attack and I do one damage. So that's going to be one damage from my opponent's overall. And I'm also going to roll a D6 to target a random location on my opponent, which you're also going to find on your area command panel. You have six different locations that can be targeted. The head cannot be targeted as a random location. So I ended up hitting location number three, which is the right upper. So I'm also going to deal one damage to the right upper. And this is going to be equal to whatever my difference was. If I had done two damage, then I would get two from the overall and two from this limb. And I'm going to add that to my cred pile. From there, then that attack is over and I can take my next action if I have any remaining. A focus attack is going to cost you three action points and your opponent still must be in the space directly in front of you. And you're also going to receive an SDS minus modifier for this. Other than that, this one allows you to target any location which you're going to nominate before making the attack, including the head. This is the one type of attack that can target the head location. From there, you're going to roll your dice as normal, checking your modifiers for both the attacker and defender. If the attacker wins the combat, they're going to do damage to both the overall and the chosen limb on the enemy. The grapple action is going to cost you two action points. And again, your opposing helot must be in the space directly in front of your helot. With this action, you are trying to grapple your opponents, basically grabbing them and allowing you to open up the grapple command group, which I'm going to cover a little bit later in the video. With this, you are not going to receive any SDS bonus or penalty, and you're going to carry this action out as normal rolling your SDS against your opponent's SDS. If you are successful, then you have successfully grappled them. No damage is done, and you will unlock the grapple command group, which I'm going to cover a little bit later. Now, there are a couple important notes with this. First, you must have a functional upper left and right in order to grapple, and you also cannot have a weapon unsheathed with this. So if you have a weapon equipped, you will not be able to do a grapple action. Another note is that you can grapple a prone opponent. If the attack is successful, then you are going to switch out the opponent's status of prone for grappled. However, if you fail, then the opponent is going to stay prone. And another important note, if two players are already grappled, a third player cannot attempt to grapple either one of those helots. The combo command allows you to chain a number of attacks together. With this one, you have to have an opposing helot in the space directly in front of your FFD. And with this one, you are always going to start with a focus attack that is going to give you an SDS minus modifier. 
With this one, you also have to declare a number of standard attacks with each standard attack costing you one action point on top of the three action points for the focused attack. From there, then you're going to carry out the focused attack. And if you are successful in dealing damage with the focused attack, then you're going to carry out all of the, the additional standard attacks that you declared beforehand, even if some of those miss. If your focus attack misses and does not do any damage, then all of your standard attacks are also going to count as being defended and the whole action is going to fail. And the final melee attack command is feint or faking an attack. With this one, it is going to cost you two action points. And again, you must have an opposing helot directly in front of your helot. And then it is not going to require a roll. You're simply going to get an SDS plus modifier on your next attack command. Once your opponent has the grapple status, this opens up a whole collection of new grapple commands you can take. And I'm going to take you through each one of these. The first one is clinch, which basically allows you to recover a little bit of your overall condition. With this one, it is going to cost you one action point and is an auto success, so there is no roll required with this one. When cover doing this one, you're simply going to take one of your cred coins from your pile and add it to your overall condition. The drag action allows me to move my opponents to a more undesirable location. For example, with this one, I would like to rotate my helot so that I drag the opposing helot into this spike pit. In order to do this, I have to spend a number of movement points equal to whatever the normal movement value is. So a rotate action costs me one movement point, so I'm going to have to spend one movement point to carry out this action. From here, it, I also this is not going to have any SDS plus or minus and it is going to require a roll. So both players are going to roll their SDS, and if the attacking player wins, then they get to reposition, basically rotating them and carrying out that move action. So I would be able to put him in the spike pit. If you fail the position, you simply will spend the points, the movement points, and you keep your facing as normal, nothing happens. And you can try again with another action. Now, one important note with this is if you do drag an, an opposing helot into a hazard, you have to roll a d6, and if you roll a 4, 5, or 6, then you safely avoid being pulled into that hazard. If you roll a 1, 2, or 3, you are also pulled into the hazard, and you both will have to resolve the effects of that hazard, starting with your opponent first, followed by your helot. And the opposing helot, after movement, is going to remain grappled. The throw action allows me to attempt to pick up an opposing helot that I have grappled and throw them into a location I have line of sight to. In order to do this, it's going to cost me two action points per space I wish to throw them. For example, in this one, it's going to cost me four action points. I'm also going to receive an SDS minus for my attack roll, and then we're going to carry out the attack action. So my opponent will receive their defense and I'm going to receive my attack dice. We'll go ahead and roll them and compare the results. So with this, my opponent rolled a 10, and I rolled a 8. So I did do the crowd pleaser, so I will receive one coin from the crowd, but my attack fails. When, a, when you fail a throw attack, your opponent is going to stay where they're at, and they're going to lose the grapple status effect. If you were successful, so let's go ahead and say instead that my opponent ended up rolling a 7 to my 8, then your opponent will be thrown into the new location, and again, they're going to lose the grapple status effect and become prone instead and then suffer the ill effects of that location if there are any. The takedown command allows you to slam a grappled opponent to the ground. With this one, it is going to cost you one action point. You will receive an SDS plus modifier to the attack, and then you're going to carry out the attack action as normal. If you are successful, you're going to switch your opponent's grapple status effect to prone and also deal them damage to their overall condition and a random location. From there, then, you're also going to, if this is the first time an opponent is prone, you'll receive plus two action points you can spend attacking that opponent. If the attack action fails, your opponent will stay grappled, but will not suffer any other effects. The final grapple command is Crush, and this one allows you to squeeze your opponent trying to do damage to them that you have grappled. With this one, it's going to cost you one action point. You will not receive any modifiers to this one, and you're simply going to carry out an SDS roll with your opponent rolling for defense. If you roll higher than your opponent, you'll do a number of damage as the difference to their overall condition, gaining those to your cred pile. If your opponent rolls equal to your roll or higher, then nothing happens. Before moving on to aim commands, I do want to talk about range and line of sight. 
So with line of sight, it is simply going to move off of your front arc at 45 degrees. So you'll be able to see the first three spaces in front of you, followed by the next five and so on and so forth as it moves out in the cone shape pattern, as you can see in this diagram. Now, there are going to be a number of different obstacles that are going to block line of sight, such as the braziers or pillars, the crates, and other things. And that will extend outward, as you can see in this diagram. So in this example, I can see or draw line of sight to an opposing helot. But if the helot was behind this pillar here, then I would not be able to draw a line of sight to that helot, as the pillar is blocking that line of sight. And the other thing is optimal range. With weapons, they are going to have an optimal range that if you are within, you will not receive a penalty for it. If you're outside of your weapon's optimal range, you can still attack, but for every space you're outside of it, you're going to receive an SDS minus modifier. So in this example, my weapon's optimal range is four squares. So I'd simply count four squares in front of me. If my opponent is within that, then I have optimal range to my opponent, where my opponent is in within that optimal range. So from here, I'm going to, to cover aim commands. With these, there are three different ones. There's wild aim, standard aim, and focused aim. And they work pretty much the same way as melee attacks, except for they need line of sight. And you'll check your weapon's range to determine if you have any modifiers to it. They're also going to cost an additional action point to do. So let's go ahead and take a look at the example of the wild aim. And then I'm simply just going to talk you through the other two examples quickly. So with Wild Aim, I have to check my line of sight, which I do have line of sight to my opponent, and I am within my weapon's optimal range, so I will not receive a minus modifier for that. From there, then, with Wild Aim, I am going to receive an SDS modif negative modifier to my attack, and then I'm going to go ahead and gather up my dice. So my opponent will roll their defense as normal. Again, we'll both be checking to see if we have any SDS modifiers to these rolls. I do have a minus, so I'm going to roll an additional die and then take the lowest two results. And then I'm going to compare those results. So let's go ahead and say that my opponent ended up rolling a three to my five result. So my attack was successful. When that happens, I'm going to do a number of damage equal to my weapon. So this ranged weapon does six damage. I'm going to do that to the overall, and then I'm going to roll a die to determine the random location it's also going to do damage to. I'm also going to reduce my ammo by one result. If I fail the attack, if my opponent rolls higher than my roll, or equal to or higher than my roll, then I'm going to not do any damage, and I will simply reduce my ammo by one result. And that is the action. Now, again, with the other ones, the standard action or standard aim at action, you're simply not going to receive an SDS minus, but it's going to cost you three action points, and then you're going to carry out the steps as normal. And with the focused action, you're going to, again, choose a location you wish to target. It's going to cost you four action points to carry that out, and you will receive an SDS minus for that one. Other than that, you'll carry out that action, as I already stated, with the wild aim. Moving over to defense commands, there are three different ones. The first one is simply a reminder that you're always going to get to roll defense against the opponent's attacks. If you roll equal to or greater than your opponent, then you will not take any damage. If you roll less than your opponent, then you'll take damage as normal. Then the other two defense commands are attached to status effects. The first one is mend. And if you have the bleeding status effect, you can take a mend command and it's going to cost you two action points to remove that bleeding status effect. The final one is stop, drop, and roll, and this one is going to be attached to the flaming status effect. If you are on fire, you can take this action by spending three action points, and that will allow you to remove the flaming status effect. And the final command is a fame command. This one is gloating, and with this one, you're basically teasing your opponent for being so bad at what they do. With this one, it is going to cost you one action point and can only be taken after a successful melee attack, aim attack, or grapple command action. Not a grapple action, but a grapple command action. With this, it is going to allow you to gain additional coins from the crowd coin pile. It's going to cost you one action point. It's also going to give you an SDS minus modifier to your defense until your next command phase. So it's going to leave you at a little bit of a disadvantage. With this one, after you do a successful attack action, based on the amount of damage you do, so let's go ahead and say you do six to your opponent's overall and six to one of their locations. 
you are going to be able to take that number of coins from the crowd coin pile and add it to your coin pile. So in this situation, I did 12 points total. So I'm gonna take 12 coins from the crowd coin pile and add it to mine, as long as there's enough in there. Otherwise, I would take as many as there are and any extras I simply will not gain. And then again, from that point on, my opponent, or I'm going to be at an SDS disadvantage to my defense during my opponent's turn. And it will clear during my next turn. Now that I've covered all the different types of commands you can take during their turn, there's a couple of other options you have. First off, if you have any influence cards, some of them can be activated during your turn to give you different bonuses or effects that you can use. You also have your different trait points. And as you accumulate those, you'll be able to activate different abilities depending upon what you're trying to achieve. And all those are going to be listed on your quick reference card by the different category. You'll need at least three points in order to activate any of these abilities. And the more points you have, the better that ability is going to be when you activate it. Each one of these will let you know basically when you can activate them. For example, with will, if I have three will or more, I can spend three of those to basically remove a prone status effect from my character. So I could do that whenever I wanted to. Now you also do have a couple of special abilities that are going to be listed on your helot's card. For example, with my helot here, I have Blood Ritual and Lay Hands. Each one of those will have different costs that I have to spend in those traits in order to carry those actions out. And again, these are also going to dictate when I can use them, but some of them will be able to be used during your turn. Once you have completed your turn, spending all the actions you're able to, or choose not to spend any additional actions and carrying out anything else you want to, your turn is over. At the end of your turn, if you have any command points left, whether they are movement points or action points, this is going to have a bad effect for you, as the crowd doesn't like you wasting their time and not making things exciting. So for every point that you have remaining, you are going to first have to take a coin from your coin cred pile and add it to the crowd pile. If you have or do not have enough coins or do not have any coins, as the case is at the beginning of the game, you are going to take those coins from your overall condition instead and add them to the crowd coin pile. So you got to be careful and try to spend all those points. And that's where the deception comes into play as your opponent can start popping those on you and choosing how many actions you can spend in the different things, leaving you out in the middle of nowhere, not being able to spend those actions and potentially taking a lot of points of damage for that if you don't have any cred coins le yet or haven't got enough to cover that overall. From here, there's only a few more things to cover. The first are situational rules, and this is going to be found on the back of your reference, quick reference guide in the blue section. Now, I'm not going to go over all of these as there's nine different ones, and they're pretty self-explanatory. For example, the very first one is crowd pleaser. With this one, anytime you are making an attack or defense and the numbers that you select are duplicates, you'll get to take one coin from the crowd coin pile and add it to your area, regardless of whether the attack or defense is successful. And that's one example of those. The next thing I want to talk about are obstacles, and there are five different obstacles in the game. Walls, pillars, crates, blood, and guts. And I want to take a look at each one of these. First off, with walls, there are no physical walls in the game as far as models are concerned. It is just the border edge around the arena. And with walls, they are going to benefit from the against the walls rule, which I covered a little earlier in the video. Next are going to be the pillars. Now, these are immobile, undestructible objects that are, again, going to provide you with cover and cannot be moved into. You cannot move your model into a space with a pillar. And they are also going to grant you against the wall benefits. Again, covered earlier in the video. Other than that, they just pretty much stand there and take up space and do not allow anything to move into them. From there, then, we have crates. Now, crates are an interesting thing in the arena. They have the potential of dropping really cool items that you can use to attack and maim your opponents. With a crate, they are considered cover until they are destroyed, and they are destructible, so you can attack them by spending three action points. And when you do, then you're going to roll on the crate table, as you can see here. Based on your results, you'll gain some sort of potential benefit, maybe. Other than that, they can also be destroyed by fire. So if fire destroys them, then nothing comes out of them. They simply are just removed from the board. And in either case, when a crate is destroyed, whether it's by you or fire, it, the crate's t uh, model is going to be removed and placed off to the side. The next obstacle is a blood tile. With these, they are destructible. So if fire moves onto them, they are going to be destroyed and removed. 
And with blood tiles, if you move onto a blood tile or rotate on a blood tile, you're going to have to roll the compass die to see which way you basically slide. If you slide into a space that has another obstacle or a helot, then you're going to simply stay in your original space without changing your FFD. So let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that I move into this space. So I'm going to have to roll and see where I go. I go northeast, which would actually put me into this pillar, which means that I'm going to stay in my original space. Again, if I rotate on that space, I would again complete my rotation and then roll the die to, 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 to see where I end up going. So I would end up going west in that manner, keeping my FFD. Now, another important thing is if you are attacked while on a blood space, you are going to be minus or you're going to receive a minus SDS modifier on that attack as you're basically trying to keep your balance while fighting. And the final obstacle are guts tiles. With them, they are destructible, so if a fire moves on there, it will destroy it and remove the tile. And with Guts Tiles, there is no penalty for moving onto them, but once you're on a Guts Tile, if you wish to move off of it or rotate on it, it's going to double the cost of that movement. So if I normally rotate on a tile, it would cost me one movement point, but on a Guts Tile, it's going to cost me two. And one other important note with this is when a helot dies and their model is removed, you're going to place a Guts Tile in the space that they were occupying. And the final topic I need to go over are hazards. And there are three different hazards included in the game. Fire, which will come from the brazers. Then we also have floor spikes and floor saws. And I'm going to go through each one of these in more detail. Before covering them, there's a couple of other important things that I need to talk about. First is placement. With these, there are three different ways they're going to be placed. First off, through the schematic, if you've chosen to play a schematic, the, the schematic is going to tell you where some of these are going to, to show up in. Otherwise, you will have some of them that will show up as RPOs or randomly placed objects. In that situation, you are going to roll the pair of directional dice to determine where they are going to go on the board as the board is going to have orange numbers for the orange die and green numbers for the green dice to place them on the grid by using these two dice as I'm going to show you a little bit later. The final way is by player choice. If the players agree on it beforehand, then they can choose to place these objects where they want them. And this might be the case if you're making a custom schematic where you're going to decide that some of these items are going to be out right away, such as floor saws or whatnot. Otherwise, they will come out at later points in the game. The next thing is to talk about is how they are activated. And there's four different ways that these objects can, or these hazards can be activated. The first is turning point duplicates. So when you are, when it becomes your turn during the command step and you are determining if you have a open slot on the turning point, if there's a coin there already, when you are going to be placing a coin, you would not place a coin, but this would trigger the turning point duplicate roll activation where certain things are going to activate, such as floor saws or floor spikes, as you're going to see. And fire will also move randomly during that step. Another way is that they're always going to be active. And then you also have that a player must activate them or during a turning point, which is only going to happen at certain times during the game where you're gonna to have to draw a turning point card. For example, with the floor spikes, once they are all out, they will not move until a turning point happens, in which case then they're all going to be pulled off and then redeployed uh, out on the board. The next thing is order activation. With this, you can simply lay out the cards in a line and activate each of the different hazards you're using in the game according to that order. And then the final thing is hazard damage. Normally, when hazards cause damage to the different helots, that damage is going to go from their overall or their limbs straight into the crowd coin pile. The one exception to this is if they are forced into that hazard by another helot, such as being thrown, pushed, or dragged into a hazard. In that situation, the first round of damage from that hazard will go directly to that player that caused the damage or caused you to be thrown into that hazard or whatever. And then after that, there are certain situations where that hazard is going to continue to do damage to you. In those situations, that damage will again go back to the crowd coin pile, as you're going to see a little bit later in the video. So from here, let's go ahead and move into the hazards and see how these nasty little things work. The first hazard I want to cover are brazers and fire. So with brazers, until they are knocked over, they are considered cover and they are indestructible. So even when knocked over, they are still considered indestructible and you will not be able to move into that space. 
In order to knock them over, you, they must be in one of your three front-facing spaces to your helot, and then you're going to spend one action point to turn them over. When you do, you're going to place them on their side, and you'll place the fire directly on the other side of where you tipped it over, directly in line with your helot. If that space contains a destructible object, you are going to remove that object and place the fire there instead. If it is an indestructible object, you're going to randomly determine where the fire goes from there by rolling a compass die. If it goes into a space that has a destructible object, again, you'll remove it. If it moves into a space that has an indestructible object, then you will simply roll again to find another space. And if it goes into a space with a helot, then you're going to remove the fire. The helot will take five condition damage and change its status to flaming. So with this, the fire would go into that space there. Now from here, fire has a number of different effects. First off, any helot that moves into its space is going to take five damage to its condition and it will remove the flame and become flaming. Now once a helot has the flaming status effect, it can move into fire as it cannot become more on fire than it already is. From there, fire is going to move at different times during the game and it will move when a player checks their turning point and they have a turning point roll duplicate, which means that when you are checking your turning point and to determine if you have a coin in that spot, if you already have a coin in the spot, then you are going to trigger a duplicate roll, which means that certain things are going to happen. Most likely a lot of hazards will be triggered depending upon which ones you've chosen to use. When that happens, you're going to roll a compass die for each flame to determine where it's going to move. If the flame moves into a space that has an indestructible object, it will simply stay where it is. If it moves into a space with a destructible object, you'll remove that object and again move the flame into that space. And finally, if it moves into a space with a helot, you'll remove the flame. The helot will take five overall and change its status to flaming. The one other important thing with fire is that it has an area of effect. So all spaces around a fire, one space away, if a helot moves out of that space or rotates in it, it will take one overall damage for each space it moves through. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that this helot here wishes to get out of that space with that or next to that space with fire. So if the helot rotates, it's going to spend, it has to take one overall. If it rotates again, it would take another overall. And let's go ahead and say he moves forward. That is another overall. And then he leaves out of that space and now he's okay. The next hazard I'm going to talk about are floor saws. And these are an optional hazard you can choose to include in your games. With these, they are only going to be triggered during a turning point roll duplicate, which means when you are checking your ratio die to determine if you need to update your turning point track, if that number already has a coin in it, that's going to trigger a turning point roll duplicate, which means with floor saws, you are going to deploy a new floor saw onto the arena board and then move it in a random direction. So let's go ahead and handle that. So first off, we're going to grab the two grid dice to determine the random placement of the saw. So this one's going to go out on four, five. So it's going to go right there in the middle of the arena. From there, then it's going to move in a random direction. So we'll keep one of the grid dice and grab the compass die and give that a roll. That is going to determine the direction and number of spaces the floor saw is going to move. So this one's going to go west up to six spaces. Now, when the floor saw moves, if it moves into a space that contains a destructible item, such as blood, guts, or crates, that item is going to be destroyed and removed from the arena floor. If it moves into a space or through a space that has a helot, then it's going to deal damage to the helot and continue moving. If it moves into a space that has an indestructible item, such as pillars, brazers, or the wall, it is going to explode, shredding, uh, spreading shrapnel in all spaces around that space that it is going to hit. So in this example, it's going to move west six spaces, but it'll hit the wall before it is able to reach there. At that point, it would explode, dealing shrapnel damage to all five spaces around it. So then let's talk about damage. So with the it, if it hits a helot directly, it's going to do 10 damage to a random location, which you'd roll a d6 to determine the location that's hit, and then you're also going to gain the bleeding status effect. If the shrapnel hits a helot, it's going to do five damage to a location, and again, you're going to gain that bleeding status effect. 
One other thing is if a blade does not reach a point where it explodes, so let's go ahead and say that it ended up rolling a three instead, it would move that number of spaces and then it would stay there for the rest of the game, where it could be activated again by a player throwing, dragging, or pushing another helot into that space where the saw blade is going to damage them again. Now, one important thing with this, anytime, if a saw blade stops on a space with a helot or a helot is pushed into a saw blade space, the helot is going to take that damage and then will be randomly moved into a new space using the compass die. If it is thrown into a space that has an indestructible item, such as the brazier here, it would actually kick it back onto that space, which again would take more damage, and then you would repeat that process, rolling the die to determine where it goes. If it hits another indestructible, it's going to flop right back into that space and take even more damage. So this could really be horrible if, it, if you roll badly on those placements. You always keep your FFD as well whenever it moved in there, whatnot. And the final hazard are floor spikes. And these are another optional hazard you can choose to include in your games. With these, they are going to again be triggered during the turning point roll duplicate, which again is triggered by the ratio die when you're checking that to see if you add another coin to that spot. So with this one, it is again going to be deployed randomly. You would roll the two grid dice to determine where it comes up. So this one would come up in two eights. So it actually would pop up right there. So when a set of floor spikes comes up, there's a couple of different effects. If it comes up in a space that has a destructible item, that item is destroyed and removed from the board. If it comes up on a space that has an indestructible item, you'll simply roll again to determine where the spikes come up and you would not place them in that space. If the floor spikes come up underneath a helot, then the helot is going to lose one of its lower limbs. If they are, have equal damage, then that player gets to choose which one is lost. Then the helot is going to be thrown off of that space. Again, you would roll the compass die to determine that direction. And if a helot moves into a space that has a destructible item, again, it would be thrown back into that space with the spike pits. This time taking 10 damage to a random location. And then again, repeating that process, which again could create a absolute disgusting mess for that player as his helot is just getting skewered over and over and over again if they roll poorly enough. Now, the same thing is going to happen if a helot is dragged, thrown into, or pushed into a set of spike pits. In that situation, again, the helot is going to take 10 damage to a random location, and then again will be thrown off, potentially to be thrown back in, depending upon what the compass die has to say about that. Now, the one other thing is once the spike pits are out, they are going to remain in that position until the next turning point, which again is once all of the coins on a turning point track are filled and the player is going to resolve a turning point card. Before that happens, all of the spike pits that are on the board are going to be removed and each one of them will be redeployed by rolling those two set of grid dice again. So as you can see, there are only four spike pits in the game. So once after a few rounds of them coming out, that is where they will stay until one of those turning points comes up again. Well, I hope you found the video helpful in learning how to play Arena. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And thanks so much for taking the time to watch the video and leave me feedback on it. I do really appreciate it and love starting a conversation with you. Until next time, I'll see you later.